Might be a bit rude, but that chair you're sitting in, it's got a shaped charge in the seat cushion. Get up without my permission. I'll blast your ass so far through your head, it'll turn the moon cheddy pie red. Fallout New Vegas is my favorite game ever, but there's no way I can make a review of that, right? I mean, everyone has talked about it. Everyone. But a review of the DLC, hmm, maybe I'd just do that. But getting to it, that's not the hard part. It's letting go. Dead Money was the first of four expansion packs released for Fallout New Vegas. The second, Honest Hearts, is a little mini open world with a faction war similar to the base game. The third, Old World Blues, is another mini open world, but it incorporates a lot of comedy elements and characters similar to the Portal series, with plenty of humor revolving around the fetishization of the concept of science. Old World Blues is generally regarded as the golden child of the four DLC. Finally, you have Lonesome Road, a big, tough-as-nails endgame gauntlet with a villain that has been teased out, Thanos-style, throughout all the other DLCs. And by teased out Thanos style, I of course mean teased out ineffectively. But what kind of game is Dead Money? Glad you asked. It's a mashup of a casino heist film and an action survival horror game set in a post-apocalyptic retrofuturism entertainment center. Feel my dick. I am rock hard for you right now, mister. The premise is a disgraced old Brotherhood of Steel leader, a faction of pre-war technology hoarders for the uninitiated, is kidnapping people to help him rob the Sierra Madre, a casino so technologically marvelous that it managed to somewhat shield itself from the nuclear holocaust that ended most of the world. To ensure their compliance, the old man, named Elijah, fits every captive with a bomb collar, that classic sci-fi trope. Well, there you have it. Nothing to lose your head over. <laughs> right? To prevent greed from leading his captives to turn on each other, if any member of the heist crew is killed, every caller goes kaboom and he starts from square one with a new batch of hostages. The biggest strengths and weaknesses of the DLC are the heist crew. Two of them are some of the most awesome, well-written, well-acted characters in any video game ever, chewing the scenery with obfuscating charm and barely concealed sadistic glee with every word out of their mouths. The other two characters suck my balls. Your crew is thus. Dean Domino, a famous performer from before the bombs fell, kept alive for hundreds of years by the ghoul mutation. He's familiar with the old world and particularly familiar with the casino. In fact, he's been surviving just outside it for all these years. Dean Domino proves what some of the more mimetic voice actors in Oblivion proved long ago. If your facial animations are utter shit, you can make up for it by being a total ham. Guards! Guards! Someone's being attacked! Hey! Are you some kind of maniac? This is the part where you flee to death! It's over, lawbreaker! You're under arrest! Dean and Elijah get the stamp of approval. Next up we have Dog, a brain-dead, bloodthirsty super mutant who is completely obsequious to Elijah. But here's the gimmick. Dog has two personalities, and Dog's more intelligent counterpart is named God. I'll give you a moment to roll your eyes out from the back of your head so you can continue watching. The idea of the player having to socially manipulate both Jekyll and Hyde and choose which one will be more helpful in each situation is a novel one. But God isn't as different from Dog as the theme suggests. He's basically just a more calculating violent asshole. You don't get any impression God takes issue with the violence he commits as Dog. He only takes issue with not being in control. It robs the character of a certain depth, and I'd wager 99% of players just stick with the dog form and only switch to God when absolutely necessary to progress the plot. I'll prop your broken body in view of the Sierra Madre so you can see what you came to steal forever out of reach as you die. Fucked up, man. Finally, we have Christine. What in God's name were they thinking with this? Where Dean Domino succeeds in spite of the very, very limited animations that the engine is capable of, Christine, well, Christine was shoved into a surgical machine by someone and now she can't speak. She can only communicate through hand gestures. Listen, I get it, and to a certain extent, I like it. The idea of trying to interpret hand gestures through a dialogue tree system could make for interesting puzzles, conversations, or potentially hazardous misinterpretations. But given the obvious limitations of the new Vegas engine, as well as the obvious budgetary constraints of DLC, for a game that was denied a massive studio bonus because of a single Metacritic point, why would you try to incorporate this? So due to the technical and financial limitations, instead of actual hand gestures, you look at Sunil O'Connor staring blankly at you and text shows up describing her hand gestures. Not too clearly though, because the point is that you might misinterpret them, so it's vaguely describing hand gestures. Although it's not too hard to guess, the bottom answer is always the right guess. Lame. In a series that was once specifically about characters like Dean Domino, Father Elijah, The Master, and Mr. House, who you just want to mine for flavor text and delicious line deliveries, you will quickly find yourself spamming through all of Christine's, uh, dialogue. 
what moves the plot forward. The base Fallout New Vegas is a fantastic game, but more so for its world building and role playing opportunities, not because of its gameplay. It's a serviceable first person shooter where your success in fights is more dependent on your skills and gear than your tactical decisions and combat prowess, which works in a role playing context. If you're fresh out of the bullet in the head clinic, don't go picking fights with any of the Wasteland's big players, or they'll send the Brute Squad to rip your fucking feet off and fuck your ass. Dead Money endeavors to retrofit the Fallout New Vegas combat system to suit a survival horror game instead of a world exploring RPG, with some successes and a handful of problems. I'll just say right off the bat that I definitely appreciate the concept. It's rare for many of these so-called role-playing games to strip your character of all their gear and give you a real challenge you must survive based on your skills and perks alone. Putting your character build to the test by subjecting them to the ringer with no equipment as a safety net seems like one of the most obvious climactic challenges for an RPG, but these games usually end in storming some massive horde of enemies with a bottomless supply of ammo and healing items. To make the new Vegas system work as a survival horror game, some gameplay features were added and some were cut. Let's take a look at the new stuff. First up are the game's main enemies, the ghost people. They're fairly tough, and when they run out of health, they just go limp for a few seconds instead of dying. So to put them down for good, you have to chop up the body, disintegrate it with energy weapons, or blow it up. How you like me now, huh? Gross. It's a cute gimmick, but it doesn't distract from how rudimentary the game's base combat still is. And while they are frighteningly powerful foes when you face them alone, the companions that follow you in the first third of dead money are hyper-competent. Of course. It was getting too quiet. They have unlimited ammo and can't actually die, so they pretty much lay waste to the ghost people, which means you won't get that survival horror tension until about halfway through the DLC. Still, the sequence where you have to run from a horde of them in a race to the casino doors with no hope of fighting them all with your limited supplies is a standout moment of panic and tension. There are also security holograms, stealth focused enemies that can only be killed by shutting off their emitter and not hurt through direct combat. I really appreciate these guys. Oblivion had the Dark Brotherhood questline for stealth focused builds, but Fallout 3 had nothing, and New Vegas had, you know, one optional path and beyond the beef where you sneak down a hallway and also nothing. So adding an enemy that requires some sneaking about is a welcome change of pace that suits the survival horror atmosphere they're going for. Then you have the cloud, smoke which drains your health in concentrated pockets and, if you're playing on hardcore mode, drains your health constantly, so, you know. Have fun with that. Then lastly, there are the radios. Their signal interferes with the bomb caller, so if you stand within range of a radio for too long, your head explodes. This was the new gameplay mechanic that critics took the most issue with, but it's my personal favorite. You have to take a gamble on if you should keep moving forward and hope the beeping countdown stops or slowly poke around the room looking for a way to shut it down. It's a fun little trial and error game that I could see being frustrating if the radio room puzzles weren't so well designed. Also, the game really comes alive during the third act when you have to stealth around hologram guards while simultaneously looking for radio radios and wall-mounted speakers. That'll get your heart racing. So to make this survival horror thing work, what Bethesda RPG elements got cut? Well, fast travel, obviously. Getting a full heal while resting in a bed. All stores have been replaced with these replicators that take casino chips, but you can't sell items to them, so no more hoarding tat to pawn onto some brainlet merchant. The vendors also don't give certain items at first. Ammo, weapon upgrades, and even healing items can't be purchased until you find the replicator codes in the overworld. It's a fun idea that I like in theory, but my god, some of these codes are hard to find without a guide. So you're limited in ammo, limited in healing supplies, Supplies, and depending on your seek and find skills, even limited on what the stores stock. Combat is better to avoid altogether and the maps are littered with death traps. What's the one thing that could prevent this setup from working as a survival horror game? To answer that question, I want you to close your eyes and tell me what you think when you hear this, unless you're driving. If you've played a few survival horror games in your day, these songs probably make you feel one way. Safe. Change one letter to find out why. Save. As in, you haven't been able to save for a while, you've braved some challenges, but you're in the clear for now. However, this feeling is tainted by what makes up survival horror. The thought, I made it through these encounters, but at what cost? Say you've been struggling with the house siege in Resident Evil 4. After a dozen attempts, you finally clear it and save at the end of the chapter. But you use some fire grenades that you had been saving to get you out of a pinch 
and use some more healing items than you would have liked. Do you have enough to make it through whatever the game will throw at you next? This is the essence of survival horror. In New Vegas, you can quick save anywhere, and in Dead Money, this is no different. So, if you're running low on supplies and you miss a bunch of shots at a ghost man in a panic, and then step on a landmine after a battle and get knocked down to 10 HP, just load a save and it'll take you back like 30 seconds. The quick save feature completely undercuts the tension built by the otherwise really solid survival horror mechanics, and the only way to get around that is to impose a rule on yourself and just make the area transition autosaves function as a save station. No quick saving. That's what I did, and it got me some decent tension. I guess that's kind of the credo of all RPGs that have this logo when you boot them up. It's a super fun game, if you mod it or impose extra rules on yourself. After the mad dash through the ghost people hoe down to get into the casino, the real party begins. The casino designs screw with radio frequencies, and the bomb callers can no longer be triggered between floors, so cooperation is out. Every member of the party now has their own objective, and they'll kill anybody who stands in their way. Dog wants to burn the casino down, killing himself and anybody inside. Dean is out to rob the casino for himself, and Christine has her mindset on killing Elijah. The confrontation with Dog slash God is one of the few moments where you actually start to feel the humanity of the character. There's a cute little stealth section where you have to shut off all the gas valves in the casino kitchen while the creature wanders the room, rambling to itself, and, in my case, eventually glitching out in the corner, unable to detect me at all. It ultimately leads to a confrontation with the dual-minded beast. Sure, you can take the inhumane option and blow him away, or trick Dog into killing himself, but the god persona is peeking through too, and for all his bluster, he doesn't want to die. Maybe you can convince him to see the light. Or maybe, if your character is really skilled in the power of persuasion, you can settle this raging battle within and bring peace to both souls by bringing them together. Maybe there can be peace in this troubled but beautiful world. So after peacefully resolving the situation with Dog, it's on to confront Dean. Turns out Dean has had a heist in the works longer than even Elijah. He planned this shit before the nuclear war, and now that he's so close, he won't let anybody stand in his way. What follows is the greatest sequence in the DLC and maybe in all of New Vegas. The theater floods with security holograms, so you have to rush through the backstage, which is itself littered with radios in every other dressing room and hallway. After solving a nail-biting key hunt, you confront Dean and this amazing voice actor gets to chew the scenery with a megalomaniacal rant about how he blackmailed a starlet the casino's owner was in love with into helping him rob the joint, just because he took the construction of the Dazzling Casino as a slight to his own ego. And he built this whole place for her. Made her the key to his vault. Like a joke. Cause of her name. Her fake Hollywood name. It's so awesome. There's actually a secret outcome in the game where if you're never sarcastic or rude with Dean in dialogue, he considers you a partner instead of an adversary. I know this condition rubbed a lot of people the wrong way because some skill checks, which in the base game never have negative consequences, are considered by Dean to be rude and they deny you a pacifist run. Me, I like it. It suits the character. Although his insane monologue on the stage stairs is the same regardless of if you're friends or enemies, which is kind of funny if you're doing a Dean partner run, how do I describe it? It's like being in a casual conversation with someone that you've known, and then they start talking about how they're currently reading Mein Kampf. Finally, a friendly face. Hey, partner. Had to take him down a few pegs. Bring him down to my level. Begin again. Some things you don't get up from. After the powwow with Domino and a disappointingly cheap feeling capper where they reuse a base game radio song and pretend it's Dean's hologram singing, which it obviously, obviously isn't, it's up to the sweets to meet the now mercifully voiced Christine. Hmm. Too little too late. Here, the real story of the Sierra Madre Casino starts to take shape. I failed to mention earlier, this game has one more survival horror tradition. It is littered with flavor text. Whether you read that or not, when you get to the suites to find Christine, and it's filled with murderous holograms, who all look like the starlet the casino's founder was lusting after, and their audio is a looping black box audio log before her death, you start to realize that maybe there was something a little off with this casino. The owner built it as a giant atomic bunker, but he did his job too well, and it was so well fortified, it became a death trap, and that's why Elijah is after it. There's no treasure or weapons in that vault, there's instructions. Instructions on how to make more of the things that at first seemed like mere gameplay devices. Holograms immune to physical attacks, poison gas that preserves technology but kills organic life, and replicator machines capable of spitting out medicine and ammunition. Elijah plans to lay waste to the old world with all of it, and shape a new nation in his image. 
This is what the old world stood for, even with bombs about to rain down on them. Now, look at it. Beautiful now its guests are all dead. Better this way. Quiet. How the Mojave should be. It helps tie together a lot of disparate sci-fi elements that could feel a bit, uh, convenience for the plotty in the early game. Through some sort of trick, the player is able to con Elijah into coming down to the vault. The game rather smartly recommends you don't try the DLC until you're at level 20, which I assumed at first was so you don't get curb stomped by the enemies. As a matter of fact, the enemies are level scaled and I started the DLC three levels below the suggestion. Uh, they only become significantly challenging after level 20. I suspect the level suggestion is so that the player will have a statistical chance of passing one of the many skill checks to get Elijah into the vault. It makes you feel like you're winning the day thanks to your build, even if it is, in reality, pretty hard to fuck up. Once he's down there, you have your final shootout and flee up the elevator before your collar pops, and, uh, if your luck is like mine, when the final cutscene starts, you crash to desktop. But there is another secret ending. Very tricky to pull off, but it is immensely satisfying. See, the casino's owner knew about Dean Domino's plan to rob him. He booby-trapped the safe to seal anyone who tried to access it below ground forever. Turns out Dean Domino received an even more fitting punishment. Without even tripping the vault trap, Dean's lust for a symbolic trumping trapped himself with the Sierra Madre for two centuries, much longer than the casino's owner could have ever predicted. You get the opportunity to walk Elijah into this trap instead, and after all his vile deeds and villainous motives, when he nails the lid shut on his own coffin, it's a fantastic moment that makes you just want to grab your crotch and shout, suck it, Elijah. But grabbing your crotch, that's not the hard part. It's letting go. I'm going under, getting over here. Oh, he might have went on living, but he made one fatal slip. Now, come on, you open up. Open the vault. I can make it worth your while. Think about what you're throwing away. I have other weapons, other technology I can share with you. And the big empty. I know the way there. I know some of its secrets. If the callers, the callers were a mistake. Oh, I see that now. <laughs> Why would I kill you? After all you've done, after all we've done together. Are you listening to me? Everything down here, I, I swear, so much you could see, you could rule the wastes with what's down here. Make your own army, reshape the world, and if others disagree, put collars on them. I, I can show you how. Don't you leave me here. You can't do this to me. Is any target here? Machine. Machine's losing power. No, I still have Pip-Boy light. Maybe, maybe. No, no, it doesn't work. Where, where's the door? Can't find the door. Come. Better in worse situations. Find a way out. Somehow. Then find that courier. Maybe Veronica. No. No, she, she thinks I'm dead. Must be someone. Maybe that other courier. One, one with a flag on his back. Maybe... No, no, no. Said he'd never come to the Sierra Madre. No way out. Can't... Can't end like this. You. I know you can hear me. When you die, courier... I'll be waiting. Your grave's going to look just like this vault. When you die, I'll be waiting here. 